Hour. Happy Hour. And now for something completely different. What's going on? This is Hoppy Hour. I am your host, Ryan Hoppy. And right here is a guy I've known for two years now. And if you would have told me two years ago that he'd be on my podcast, I don't even think he would be sure that he'd be doing it. You may have seen him around town. If you're listening worldwide, you got to check out Calvin Kratom. But here for all our Tampa Bay listeners, Sal, who you've probably seen at every Kava bar ever, is on Happy Hour. What's up, bro? What's going on? What's going on? Ah, same old man. I've been meaning to have you on. There was a day I was supposed to do it with you. That sounds weird. About a year ago. <laughs> and then I was like, I think we just forgot and it never happened. So here we are. It's been a couple of times, but I'm glad we finally uh, got it on the calendar. So Sal, you're a very fascinating guy. It feels like um, everybody flocks to you. Everybody that talks to you, you're like this fridge and they're all like magnets. It feels like everybody always comes up to Sal and wants advice. Where do you think that stems from? It's fascinating. I've asked you for advice. You have. Um, since I was a kid, my father always, my parents, my family used to tell me I've got what's called the gift of gab. Yeah. Um, I can sell, they used to tell me I can sell ice to an Eskimo. You can sell shit to a farmer. Yeah. Or I can sell you the Brooklyn Bridge three times before you even realize you bought it. Yeah. Um, love talking to people. I do always have. I've talked to, I talk to strangers on the street probably every day. How do you do it? Because I feel like I want to open up my repertoire of talking to people. And I've gotten better at it since coming to Cow Bars. But I just see you, Matt, and it just comes so naturally. Um, I, I honestly just listen. You know, um, as I was when I was um, younger, I always used to just respond to people because of what they said. Yeah. You know, I would res just respond without really listening. As I got older in my career, just in life in general, I learned to listen and to understand and to not just respond because you can learn something from anybody that you talk to. And a lot of times when you're talking to someone and you notice they're just kind of responding and going through the motions, I'm guilty of that. Some Sometimes you can mm -hmm. kind of tell that the person doesn't care and you kind of walk away and you're like, ah, oh, whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, there, don't get me wrong. There's conversations that I just don't want to yeah. hold with people. You yeah. know, there's always going to be those conversations. There's going to be people that you just really don't want to talk to, right? Um, perfect example, I work in an industry where I talk to people for 10 to 12 hours a day. Nine times out of 10, when I come up here, I don't want to talk to people. Yeah. In terms of, I don't want to have to feel obligated to talk to you. Yeah. Um, but I think everybody here and places that I go with like the, my, my close circle, my people that know me know that I'm, an, I'm always available, I'm approachable can literally talk to me about whatever, whenever, and I'll always listen. And I always ask them the questions, the same thing I ask people I work with. Are you venting or do you want solutions? Because yeah. it's the two different mindsets I have to give you. The thing I want to ask you, um, you used to, you haven't completely quit drinking, but you've really cut down on it since um, drinking kava and kratom since I've known you for mm -hmm. two years. There's a lot of people that hate on kava and kratom. Mm -hmm. And if you type in kava and kratom on Google, it's all bad things. The WebMD, <clears throat> the Mayo Clinics of the World, the Cleveland Clinics of the World, Reddit, Quora. What do you say to those people that always seem to find the negatives in kava and kratom? Uh, I think I would like to challenge them to the difference between truth, lies, and bullshit. Mm -hmm. uh, it's something that the uh, owner of the business that I work for um, teaches us. It's the difference between truth, lies, and bullshit. Don't believe everything you read because chances are it's one person's opinion or it's a very small study group of yeah. data. Um, I was introduced to Kava and Kratom. We're in 2024. Uh, January of 2022 was when I started hanging out in Kava bars more um, consistently. I was very heavy drinker at the time. Yeah. Um, hated everything that was really going on in my life just with some stuff that I had going on. But the more I drink kava and kratom, the less I wanted to drink uh, alcohol. I don't miss it. There was a day um, we go to the chill room. That's one of my favorite kava bars in the area, if not my favorite. And it was the day after my birthday, and I was throwing up in the parking lot from drinking um, 
a lot of wine the night before, and there were a lot of nachos that were being sold that day, and I just got really sick. If you remember, yeah, I that recall era. those days very vividly. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> the funny part was, I went, I'm done. I remember I was sitting in a car, and I went, I'm out. I have gotten tipsy since then, mm-hmm. but I have not been full on drunk since September because I just went. I, I told this to somebody the other day. It can be so much fun drinking and partying. Yeah. From 7 p.m. to 3 a.m., 4 a.m., whatever time you're out, those nine hours yep. are amazing. But the next day, I'm realizing the effort and money and what I was doing to my body wasn't worth the nine hours of fun. No, it's not. I, I did it for a long time. From the, I didn't really start drinking heavily until I was about... I was, I was older. I was. I'm not going to lie. I was probably about 21, 20, 21 years old when I started drinking heavy. I didn't end my heavy drinking until I was 28 years old. So two years ago. So yeah, almost two years ago. So the difference I've felt over the last just year um, has been astronomical. I did it. I tapered it off a lot, right? I stopped going out during the week, like weekdays, and I'd only go out on like Fridays and Saturdays and Sunday fun days, right? Then that got cut down to just Saturday nights or Fridays and Saturdays. And then it got cut down to just Saturdays. And now I just, I I really don't enjoy drinking. I don't like the taste of alcohol. I think I miss more what alcohol provided. Like perfect example, my favorite thing to do was on football Sundays, go up to the sports bar, eat a couple, you know, a couple beers as in was probably like five or six beers, some shots. But then by Sunday night, it's 10 o'clock at night. I'm drunk. I'm tired. I feel like shit. And I have to be at work the next morning. And I not on my A game when I have that brain fog of the night, you know, post drinking. I, it just doesn't feel good. I don't want it anymore. I don't like it. And I think everybody should experience that at least once in their life and may, let them make their own decision. The scariest thing um, is blacking out. There's yeah. a lot of times in the early to mid 2010s that I have no memory of yep. that night. And you would come home and you would be panicking like the next morning. It's like 9 a.m. and you're like, do I have my credit card? Do mm-hmm. I have that's the worst feeling ever. It's it's awful. I can't tell you how many times I've blacked out and I would text my friends like, all right, do I owe anybody an apology? Yeah. Is there anything I need to be aware of? And like, nope, you're good. I said, okay, let's keep it moving. Yeah. You know, so yeah, I've, I've been down that road and I'm happy I'm not on it anymore. It's funny. We graduated in the same graduation class. Now I'm from Chicago. You were here in Tampa when you graduated, correct? St. Petersburg, Florida. Yes. yes. St. Pete, not Tampa. Not Tampa. <laughs> not Tampa. St. Petersburg, Florida, 727. How prominent was Project X culture down here? Because up in the Midwest where there was a lot mm-hmm. of house parties, when the movie Project X came out and LM, LMFAO was the number one band and it was just party, 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 Jersey yep. Shore era, we used to throw house parties that would try to resemble the movie Project X. Was mm-hmm. that a thing here? Um. Do you, do you remember the movie Project I X? I do remember the movie Project X. I always had a dream of holding a Project X party myself, yeah. to be honest. Um, we all did. Glad I didn't. <laughs> Just glad I didn't. Uh, I ran with a very rowdy crowd. We Me never too. did anything that was, you know, extremely, you know, nothing illegal in that aspect of anything I have to worry about coming back to bite me. We just really, truly lived as if tomorrow wasn't promised. And I think back now... Partying was always something that was constant in my life. Always constant in my life. Even growing up, there was never a night that I didn't, you know, my family, we didn't have family over, you know, whether it was coffee and cake. I grew up in a very, in an older New York Italian family. So it was always those Sunday dinners and, you know, going out. But for the most part, I would say, you know, the Project X culture wasn't big here in terms of house parties, Everybody still always partied. I think it's because in Illinois, there's basements and there's not basements here. No, but we have garages. I did a lot of garage parties. (laughs) I always hung out in garages. (laughs) I think about how weird these parties were that I went to 14, 15, 16 years ago. Yeah. There was a house of this kid named Dan. He was the popular kid. Didn't he played hockey and he dated this girl named Miranda that kind of looked like Dale Gribble's wife on King of the Hill, (laughs) but like a millennial version. And they, one time I was really drunk and I walked in and I'm having fun. The mom was on the second floor of the house (laughs) watching like everyone loves Raymond while everyone's doing dirty things (laughs) in the basement. And it's so weird to think that that actually happened. 
Can you imagine yeah, I, that? I, I, I couldn't. My parents never, my parents didn't know anything I was doing. They knew who I was with. They knew where I was. Yeah. But my parents never knew everything that I was doing. And if you ask my parents today, yeah, I'm going to be 30 years old. My eldest sister just turned 37. My parents still don't want to know everything that we're doing. My mom, because I've been very open about my life on the radio the past decade, my mom knows everything about me. And mm-hmm. it's there's definitely a before Ryan and radio, mm-hmm. me and my mom, energy and after. Mm-hmm. Just she knows how I lost my virginity. She knows my body count. She she knows things like it's the complete opposite <laughs> with me, bro. My mom knows everything. It's kind of a bond, but it's also horrifying. My sister knows more about me than my parents do. And I do that on purpose. Yeah. I like my parents to believe that. Um, they know I'm no saint. Yeah. They know I'm no saint. They they raised what I like to say. They raised their favorite asshole. Yeah. You know I am who I am because of my my family and my upbringing. But no way in hell am I going to sit here and tell my parents about everything I've done. <laughs> no way. There's just some things that they don't need to know. There's certain things a parent doesn't need to know. Absolutely. Dude. By the way, how often are you on dating apps? Do you use that? I do not. I retired from. I that. can't. I, can't, do it. I can't stand them. I'm out. I nope. I don't use Bumble. I don't use Tinder. I don't use Hinge. To those who use it, I wish you all the best. It's I, I done. have friends who have met the loves of their life on on dating apps. I do. I have them. I've heard things about Facebook dating for elder millennials to get married off of that. I used Facebook dating when I lived in Vegas. <laughs> when I lived in Vegas, I How was that? Uh, that was. I lived out there for about a year and a half. Um, was during COVID actually. So, um, it was, uh, it was an interesting time, but I did, I used Facebook dating while I was out in Vegas. I met some, some great girls out there, went on dates, you know, did the, lived the Vegas life as much as I did. It was the industry that I worked in at the time. Um, so yeah, no, I mean, Hey, Godspeed if you use dating apps, just, it's not my thing. What are the differences between visiting Vegas and partying and living there? Like, were there places that were kind of like hidden gems that most tourists didn't know about? Oh yeah, because the tourists they just stick to the strip and Fremont Street, the bar, the, you know, the places that I would go hang out at were local sports bars that really didn't see a lot of tourists. Yeah, so it was a very different. Um, it's very different. Locals actually stay away from the Vegas Strip, from Las Vegas Boulevard. They don't hang out there. That's interesting. I went there with my uncle when I was fifteen, so I didn't really get to have any fun. Mm. Yeah, it's like uh, compared to this. We live, I live, you know, we live in, I live in St. Petersburg. We live in a beach town. Yeah. Locals avoid the beach during summer and spring break. Why? Because it's full of tourists. Same concept out there. Problem is it's year round in Vegas where it's a little seasonal. That's a good point. What are the houses like out there? It's very similar to here. You have your, you know, your rich neighborhoods. You have your middle class neighborhoods. You have your up and coming areas. Yeah. That's I'll call them. Um, very similar, very similar to here, except for there's no grass. It's crazy. There's no grass. How much rain is there? It didn't rain once in the 18 months I lived in Vegas. It's crazy. It didn't rain once. I never thought about that. What are the pools like? Cause I, um, I know pools here. It seems like every person that has money has a pool attached to their house. Everybody, almost everybody that I met in Vegas had a pool. Thousand percent. Um, whole house pools, again, very similar to here. But the tourists would go to hang out on the strip at those the hotel pool parties. That wasn't my thing either. We were essentially born in the same year, and it's really weird to think that like we're pretty lucky that like Facebook Live and Periscope back in the day and all that yep. didn't really come out until after we graduated high school. Thank God. Because now I'm thinking about the things that happened between like 05 to 2014. I'm, I'm very happy my friends don't have those old videos of me back in the day. Very oh, proud man. of that. Very happy. There was a party I went to, and um, there's social media proof of it. It's from 2011, and I went wearing a Kobe Bryant jersey and basketball shorts, and kids said I should put on blackface, but I didn't. Good thing you didn't. That's, and I'm very glad I that's, did that. That's uh, probably the worst thing you could probably do, have done. They wanted me to, and I was like, nope. No, that's that's we don't do that. That's not okay. That I'm th- There's times kids tried to do pranks like that on me, and I never fell for it, but I'm looking back on it, and I'm like, huh, that really could have gone bad. Yeah, especially today in today's society. Yes, that could have backfired. Yeah, and I think about this too. Do you believe in horoscopes and like ast- astrology? Because I'll say a lot of times that I have Virgo luck mm-hmm. and I say it a lot joking around, 
And sometimes people go, oh, you believe in that? And it's like, I don't know what I believe in it. But if sometimes I look at the Virgo traits mm-hmm. and I'm like, I have that, I have that. It's weird. Um, I have, yes, I, I do believe in it. Um, because there's, you know. Oops. One second. Uh, let me uh, reset. it. I do believe in it. Yeah. I do believe in horoscope stuff. Um, I'm a Leo myself. And the way you kind of you know, mentioned earlier how people gravitate towards me. I'm a talker. I like talking to people. That's that kind of, that's that hard on that hard on your sleeve characteristic. Yeah. The unapologetically myself characteristic. I would believe that. Yeah. Um, I, people argue with me on this guy. Tell people I don't have an ego. I, I don't, I I'm, I'm a pretty humble person personally, professionally. I would say I am proud of what I've accomplished professionally. Um, but ego Leos tend to have a very big ego, and I'm just I don't believe that I do. You're just very um, you're very comfortable with yourself. You're very is that the right word? You're I'm very confident. I am very confident. Yes, I'm very confident in my abilities. It took me a while to get there. I will say that I wasn't always this kind. When of, did you hit that? Um, believe it or not, when I moved out to Vegas. Um, I hadn't moved out of my parents' house yet. Yeah. You know, I was 25 years old, had never lived on my own, you know, and I will never forget this. I was supposed to move to Austin, Texas, so San Marcos, Texas, to be exact. I was supposed oh, to move man. to Texas. Oh, man. And everything was getting worked out. And my boss at the time said, hey, so and so is going to give you a call, you know, just kind of hear him out and let me know what you think. I said, okay. And it was our director of operations. And he calls me and goes, Hey, our new hire in Vegas fell through. Yeah. I'd like to extend the position offer to you. Do you accept it? And I'm like, I've never lived outside of Florida. I took a four week furlough from life in in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but I'd never moved away from home. So it was like, well, I've never been out to Vegas. You know, can I go out? I need to go out there and see it for myself. He goes, okay, can you be out here Friday? It was Wednesday. So in 48 hours, I flew out to Vegas for three days. Before he, when he dropped me off the airport, he goes, I need to know in a couple of days. So I'm like, okay, We're moving very quickly. Yeah, I said, very yes. quickly. I said, yes, sign the contract. And I said, yes, it didn't hit me until I was packing up my office um, and packing up my desk. And I had sat there and I had an emotional breakdown, full blown anxiety attack. And I called my dad and I was like, dad, I don't think I can do this. I said, like, this is the dumbest decision I've ever fucking made in my life. What am I doing? And he goes, yeah, you can. He goes, and you're going to do it. He goes, what are you worried about? I was like, dad, I said, I'm, I'm leaving you. I'm leaving mom. I'm leaving my sister, my niece. My, I'm leaving my whole life moving 3,500 miles away. The only family member I have out there was a cousin I had met once who I love and adore to death. I couldn't have gotten through Vegas without her. But I had to portray confidence that I could do this. And I sure as hell I did it. And it was right around then where I really started to build my self-confidence. What was the biggest cultural difference you noticed between Vegas and Florida moving there? Like the first thing you saw? <laughs> the first thing I saw was people out there are a lot more slower paced. I've learned that anything west of the Mississippi River it does not move like we do here on the East Coast. They, they don't – it's it's almost like they are okay with moving at a slower pace. And I don't mean physically. I mean like – everything that they do and i chalk that up because they're getting closer and closer to hawaii the further west you go and you know out there they have island time yeah you know out here on the west coast you know i was born in new york raised in florida but i was raised by you know my whole family was born and raised in new york city i have a very different work ethic to me than most people do here in florida let alone out into the west coast i'm a get it in get it done and keep it moving kind of guy i don't waste time out there they feel like all they have is time so I would say that was the biggest cultural difference. Was it hard for you? It was. It was. I'm a very direct person. You'll never have to worry about nope. trying to misinterpret what I say. And out there, it was very, I don't, it, I don't know. It was just like, it's like everybody had a smoke screen up. Like they weren't being up front. They weren't being very blunt and honest. It was, that was the biggest cultural difference for me. That took me a while to adjust to. So you were saying when you moved there that you had a panic attack. Over the years, what are some of the best memorable moments of advice from your father? Oh, man. Um, 
from the time I was born, he always used to tell me, always finish what you start. Um, do as I say, not as I do. Um, those are always two big ones. Yeah. Um, there's recent, I would say recently there was an argument in my family that there's a difference between a, being a, a, a nice guy and a good man. So I'd say my father always raised me to be a good man and not a nice guy. I agree with that. There's always, there's a bit, there is a big difference. Like my father's a good man, not a nice guy, but he's a good man. He's nice. Not saying he's, my dad's not like this asshole, you know, my dad's a nice guy, but he was always a good man first because a good man is always going to do what has to be done for their family. Yeah. That was always the big, that was, that's some of the best advice I ever got from my dad. And to always finish what you start. What about your mom? Uh, mama always knew I was going to be the free bird. Mom always wanted me to be a simple man. Yeah. Never, never want for too much. You're only, one thing she told me when I moved out to Vegas was you're only as stuck as you make yourself. You're only as stuck as you make yourself. And that was one thing that always has resonated with my mom. Um, mom's always been the uh, person that can remind me where I came from. Yeah. So that's, that's my parents in a nutshell. So right now we are recording on June 10th, 2024. If people are listening in 2030, let's say in six years they find us, what is your prediction for the next six years? Prediction for what? Just in general, like where do you think America is going to be when we're in our mid thirties? Hopefully in a lot better spot than it is now and where it's been over the last 20, 30 years. I know it's very concerning. It is. I, I fear, I fear for my retirement. I don't think it's going to be existing when I turn 70. <laughs> it I know 40 years. <laughs> it really is crazy. It is. It is. It's just funny. Like when you work with boomers and they're the ones with all the money mm -hmm. and then they hate on millennials and it's like everyone's working like 70 hours a week, even if they're not working at a job doing things outside of work. Yeah. Well, if I knew that the economy was going to be what it is today, I would have started saving for a house when I was in fifth grade. And knowing you, <laughs> Sal, I, I know you're not kidding. You're being dead serious. I'm, I've never been more serious about anything in my life. Yeah. If I knew what the economy was going to be like now, in I would have started saving 20 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And whoever, who would have, who would have thought that eggs are $7 a dozen? I know. I go to Aldi's. That's why I can't, I don't go to Publix. Aldi's food isn't amazing, but it's like the only place that you can get a good amount. At this point, it's not about quality. It's, it's about, about quantity. About eating. It's all about, you got to survive. Yeah. I uh, listen, I shop at Aldi. I shop at Save-A-Lot. I shop at Winn-Dixie. I shop at Walmart. I shop at Publix. I shop everywhere. There's certain things I need to get from other stores. For example, there's certain things they can only get from Publix, which is being the, what I find to be the world famous Publix sub, which oh, so if good. you haven't tried one, you're missing out. But um, I actually had that for dinner last night. So I'm proud of myself. But um, yeah, no, the, I think, where we're at right now is a very pivotal moment for for our generation you know we're as millennials you have two sides of the millennials you have the older millennials which is like my sister 37 years old then you have us we're more on the tail end of the millennials i was reading online it's called the zillennial we are yes we are old enough to be millennials and fall into that category but we're also young enough to at least understand and relate to the generation after us and i've never been more disappointed about a characteristic in my life <laughs> It's horrible. I don't want to associate with myself with that generation. Do you think we've become old man on the front lawn, or is Gen Z that bad? Mm. I've been trying to like give them a, the benefit of the doubt. My niece, if I my my niece, I believe is Gen Z. What year is she born? Oh nine. She, so this She's is the fascinating very part. Tail end, I believe, of Gen, Gen Z. Gen Z goes till 2010. Then it's Gen Alpha from 2010 to 2024. And then it's Gen Beta. I looked it up online. So the babies being born now through 2040 are Gen Beta, bro. You just gave me an existential crisis. <laughs> I didn't know I was going to have it. Almost 30 years old. Well, what's going on in your brain? <laughs> that, that, that there's two. There's three generations after us now. I think. Z A. Yeah. And we might even see C. And we might see whatever they come up of C. Yeah. Um, I, 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 I will say this about the generational differences. I will say this um, say it. because I think it's important that people hear it. It is not about the generation you're born in. It is not about what society tells you you're supposed to be because of the year you were fucking born. Yeah. It boils down to the people that you surround yourself with. 
you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. I agree with that. You are become the average. So you can either be above average, below average, or just average. There is a quote that I saw today from somebody at work, and it said the difference between an ordinary and extraordinary is that little bit of extra. Damn. That's good. I feel like your job pro- provides quotes all day. Um, my line of work, yeah. We um, we, we have a I, – I am thankful for the job that I have, to be very honest, in the career field that I chose. But um, I think it boils down just because I love helping people. You do. And I have a passion for small business owners. So we were sitting at the bar like we do every day at the chill room, and I was like, I got to get this interview with <laughs> Sal done. Sal, it's been a lot of fun having you on. Thank you. You are, I don't want to kiss your ass because I've done that in the beginning of the show, but <laughs> you're one of the few people that I actually trust. Like most people in Tampa Bay are pretty scummy and like kind of, they, they blend with what's the popular opinion in the room. Yes. And you've always been the guy that whatever you say to someone's face you say in that crowded room. Yes. Whatever. If I say something when you're not in, I listen, I will always defend people when they're not in the room to defend themselves, right, wrong, or indifferent. Yeah. You've got to give people a platform to defend themselves. If you don't, you are not a part of the solution. You become part of the problem. Damn. That's deep. It's just the truth. Sal, thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me. Of course, bro. Appreciate you. Happy hour. Happy hour.